You know, Paul the Apostle said, I want to know him in the power of his resurrection. But he also said, I want to know him in the fellowship of his suffering. And somehow we want to experience the power of the upper room and exempt what he went through on the cross. And that's an impossibility. So tonight we embrace his passion. We embrace what he's done for us as we partake in the fellowship of his suffering. John chapter 19 and verse number 31. The Jews, therefore, because it was the preparation that the body should not remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath day was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken, that they might be taken away. Verse 32, then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other, which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side. And forthwith came there out blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true. And he knoweth that he saith true, that you might believe. For these things were done that the scripture should be fulfilled. A bone of him should not be broken. We take our text tonight from verse 34. The NIV reads it like this. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced Jesus' side with a spear, bringing a sudden flow of blood and water. One more rendering, if you don't mind. The Message Bible says one of the soldiers stabbed him in the side with his spear. Blood and water gushed out. Father, we thank you for the reading of your word tonight. And for the next few moments of time, we ask you to enlighten the eyes of our understanding. Yes, we do approach this with an attitude that is somewhat somber. For it's through the eyes of sobriety we can really appreciate your suffering. And we want to pause just before we get to Sunday to say thank you. Thank you for every stripe you took for us. Thank you for all the ridicule you suffered for us. We love you tonight, and we're here to show you how much we really love you. Would you clap your hands and let the Lord know you love him one more time on this evening? Now, before you sit down, I want you to shout to God with a voice of triumph. Come on, everybody. Lift your voice and bless him tonight. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. High five about three people and tell them you really are in the right place at the right time tonight. You really are. You may be seated. Calling the day of the crucifixion Good Friday is a designation that is peculiar to just the English language. I was studying this today and found out that even in German, it's morning day or it's morning Friday. And that is what the disciples did on that day. They mourned. They thought they had lost it all. I've read that the word good used, used to have secondary meaning and the word was holy, but I can't trace that back in its etymology. So there are a number of cases in set phrases where these words God and good got switched around because of their similarity. One case would be the phrase God be with you, which today is goodbye. So perhaps Good Friday was originally God's Friday. But I think we call it Good Friday because in retrospect, all that, tragedy, all that tragedy brought about the greatest good that there could ever be. Just touch your neighbor and tell them welcome to Good Friday. As I was at home today praying and preparing, I thought there are so many messages, right, Pastor Jimmy, that could be preached on this day. 
we could preach on the word final. Just one word, final. It's been a week of finalities for the Savior. He made his final approach to Jerusalem. He made his final visit to the temple. He made his final trip to his favorite town, Bethany. He has preached his final sermon. He has partaken in his final supper with his disciples. He kneels in the garden for the final time. He is betrayed with a kiss from Judas in his final embrace. On his final night that ran into his final morning, he faces six trials while looking at his final hour. And we could preach on that. We could preach on the crucifixion, certainly. Tonight, we could talk about the cry of the city. Give us Barabbas. Interestingly enough, his name means the son of the father. Give us the son of the father. And the cry of the city said, let his blood, Jesus' blood, be on us. Little did they know they were prophesying. Jesus is mocked. He's scourged. He's crowned with a crown of thorns. We could preach on the nails in his feet, one nail in each hand. The seamless robe that they draped upon him, or certainly tonight, there will be a preacher somewhere in the earth that will preach on the seven sayings of the cross. In Luke 24, Jesus says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do, number one. Number two, he said unto the thief, Verily I say unto thee, Today you shall be with me in paradise. The third saying would come from John chapter 19, In verse 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Then to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. The fourth saying would come from Mark chapter 15 and verse 34. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried with a loud voice saying, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Certainly, we could preach that. The fifth saying would come from John 19, 28. After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said two words, I thirst. John 19.30 would be the sixth stanza. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said three words, it is finished. What is finished? His life, certainly not. His legacy, certainly not. His purpose, certainly so. I've done what I've come to do. It, I'm not finished. It is finished. Luke 23, 46 would be the final phrase. When Jesus cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. The crucifixion, the word final, all of this is powerful. It's all dramatic. Suspenseful, mysterious, intriguing, insightful. But as I studied today and prayed and prepared for tonight, there's this one idea. There's this one stream. There's this one string of fabric. There's this one flow. This one drop that we can't ignore. It is found in scripture over 450 times. And it is found in our text tonight. John 19, 34. Forthwith came there out blood. I'm going to preach for just a moment tonight on the subject entitled, There Must Be Blood. 
I want you to say that to three people around you. There must be blood. One theologian has pointed out the blood of Christ is mentioned in the writings of the New Testament nearly three times as often as the cross of Christ. The blood of Christ is mentioned in the New Testament five times as frequently as the death of Christ. Spurgeon, you know Charles Spurgeon. He said, Scripture teaches us that the blood produces life, that life lies in the blood. Blood, therefore, is the mysterious link between matter and spirit. How is it that the soul should in any degree have alliance with matter through blood? We cannot understand. But certain it is that this is the mystery link which unite these apparently dissimilar things together so that the soul can inhabit the body just like life can rest in the blood. I heard a preacher say the Bible is a book of blood. The Bible is a bloody book. When we are accused of preaching a gospel of blood, we proudly plead guilty to the charge. For the only thing that gives life to our teaching and power to the word of God is the fact that it is the blood which is the very life and power in the gospel. The Bible declares itself to be a living book, the only living book in the world. And it is able to impart life to those who will believe with their hearts what the Bible teaches. As I was thinking about this idea of this stream, this flow, this fountain called the blood, I couldn't help but study God's own perspective of the blood. And I had to go all the way back to the bearishest of time in the fourth chapter of the book of Genesis where the Bible says in verse 10 that God said, What hast thou done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying unto me from the ground. And now you are cursed from the earth, which hath opened her mouth to receive your brother's blood from thy hand. This is called fratricide, brother killing brother. Now when you till the ground, it shall not henceforth yield unto thee her strength, a fugitive and a vagabond. You shall be in the earth. And it told me something. In the law of first mention concerning the blood, two things. Number one, the blood has a voice. Hear me, blood has a voice. The second thing it told me is that God hears the voice. When you're training, training a dog, there's a whistle that can be used and a human ear can't hear that whistle. You can't hear the whistle, but the dog can. You can't hear the voice of blood, but God can. What did Abel's blood say? Judgment. Vengeance. Retribution. And God responded with these words. You will be separated, Cain, from God because Abel's blood is crying to me. You will be frustrated in the land because your brother's blood is talking to me. You will be wandering, searching for direction and purpose all the days of your life because your brother's blood is speaking to me. And then I got to Hebrews 12 in verse 22. And I read something about us. But you are come to Mount Zion. You have come to the city of the living God. You have come to the heavenly Jerusalem and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus the mediator of the new covenant. And you have come to the blood, to the blood of sprinkling that speaks better things than that of Abel. No, the blood of Jesus does not speak like the blood of Abel. The blood of Jesus says these things. 
it preaches a stronger word. Hebrews 12, 24 says, not judgment, but justification. Romans 5, 9, we are justified by his blood. Not vengeance, but forgiveness. 1 John 1, 7, the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. Not retribution, but redemption. Acts 20, 28, take heed therefore to yourselves and to all the flock over the which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. Not retribution, but redemption. He's talking to preachers. And I wonder where we got off in not preaching about the cross anymore. Where did we leave off not talking about the suffering of Christ anymore? Why have we approached this sacred desk and presented ourselves to you as mere motivational speakers while all the time ignoring the power of the written word? And not addressing the fact that the blood is the best, the best thing you could ever approach in your life. You didn't just come to church tonight. You came to the blood tonight. Let's talk about the blood. If the blood's important to God, it must be important to us. Everyone wants to talk about the power of the Holy Spirit. But no one wants to preach on the passion of that cross. Are you in the building tonight? And I thought, God, you hear blood. And then God told me, not only do I hear blood, but I see blood. In other words, I'm looking for blood. In Exodus chapter 12, he says, slay the lamb that is unblemished. Take the blood of that lamb and put it on every doorpost on each side of the door. And he said, when I pass through the land, when I see the blood, I will pass over that house. Jesus is the lamb that was slain for the sin of the world. And when my little mama used to lay her little hands on me when I was a teenager and say, I plead the blood of Jesus over you, she was putting that blood on the doorpost of my destiny. I could not make a passage without walking through the blood. I could not go through the next step without passing through the blood. I could not not get to the next room unless I pass through the blood. Bring back the blood. God is looking for the blood. God wants to hear from the blood. God wants to see the blood. And then I thought not only does God hear it, not only does he look for it, but he values the blood. 1 Peter 1, 18, for as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by the tradition of your fathers, but you have been redeemed with the precious blood of Christ as of a lamb without blemish and without spot. The blood paid the ransom. He made you and then bought you back. With his blood, and the blood was the price he paid. He values the blood. So that's God's perspective. That's how God looks at blood. And if blood is important to God, shouldn't it be important to us? Bless your name, Jesus. My thoughts graduated. And I thought, God, if your perspective of blood is on this wise, then what must our perspective be? How shall we peer at the blood? And I heard these words, without it, you have no confidence when you approach me. Without it, you have to come in ashamed. Without it, you come in apologizing. Without it, you come in with your head hung low and your shoulders slumped over. But with the blood. <laughs> Hebrews 10, 19. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for you through the veil. That is to say his flesh. So when you have the blood of Jesus on your life, you do not approach the throne of grace embarrassed, a shame. You come boldly into the throne. You come boldly because you have the blood. Not a blood you shed. 
I learned this in studying the Passover lamb. That when the priest examined the Passover lamb, he never looked at the sinner. Y'all didn't hear that. He only looked at the lamb. People want to look at your sin, but God wants to look at the blood. People want to remind you of your dirt, but God says, I can't find no dirt because I can't see through the blood that was shed to cleanse my son or my daughter from their sin. Without the blood, we remain at a distance. Ephesians 2.13, but now in Christ, you who some, sometimes were far off are made near by the blood of Christ. Without the blood, you always remain at a distance. But when you have the blood, you always draw near. Without it, you cannot be forgiven. Hebrews 9.22, the New International Version says, in fact, the law requires that nearly everything be cleansed with blood. Watch, and without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. You cannot sit here and praise God in freedom tonight. You cannot sit here and lift your hands in forgiveness tonight without him shedding the blood for you to enjoy the freedom that you are enjoying. I'm going to preach the whole message. I've decided that. Nothing sta states it better than that old hymn that says, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunge beneath that flood and they lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains and sinners plunge beneath that blood and they lose all their guilty stains and we all sing that first stanza but I read the second stanza and I got more excited. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there have I, though vile as he, washed all my sins away. I've washed all my sins away. Washed, what? All my sins away. And there have I, though vile as he, washed all my sins away. And I thought, does this song have a third stanza? And certainly it does. Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power till all the ransomed church of God are safe to sin no more, are safe to sin no more, are safe to sin no more, till all the ransomed church of God, what? To sin no more. And I thought, surely that's the last stanza. Yet I found one more. Ever since by faith I saw the stream, thy flowing wounds supply, Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die and shall be till I die and shall be till I die. Redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. And I looked at the blood and I said, God, I see now how you perceive the blood. I see now how we receive the blood. I see that blood is paramount to you. And I see that blood is purposeful to us. Is there yet another perspective that I should concern myself with? And as sure as I'm talking to you, I felt impressed by the spirit that, yes, there is. There's this final perspective that every one of us should look at tonight. And that's the perspective of Satan. Huh. Will you come with me just for a moment? Can I finish this? Just walk with me. And let's go to that garden. In Luke twenty-two forty-four, 44. And Jesus being in agony prayed more earnestly. And his sweat was as it were. Great drops of blood falling to the ground. Agony. A struggle for victory. 
in a contest held in the place of an assembly. The word agony in the Greek is used of someone fighting a battle with fear. Yes, your Savior was dealing with severe struggles. Yeah. Yeah. He learned obedience through the things he suffered. And the champion of life is now caught in agony. So I ask myself, is it a garden or is it a battlefield? Jesus swept drops of blood in a garden. Satan sees it and he remembers another garden. See, God lost the first Adam in a garden. He found the second Adam in a garden. The will of man ruled in the first garden, but the will of God ruled in the second garden. In the beginning, he walked in the garden. In the end, he knelt in the garden. In the first garden, everything was lost. In the second garden, everything was found. In the first garden, sin entered the world. In the second garden, sin was finally defeated. So what does Jesus see? He sees what disciples can't see. The familiar garden has become a fighting ground. He sees the staging of Satan. Demons on one side. Angels on the other side. He sees the evil one preparing for the final encounter. The enemy lurks over the hour as a scepter. And Jesus kneels down. Jesus sees nationalities looking as sheep without a shepherd. His mind reflects back to Adam and Eve, yielding to temptation. And he cries out to his disciples, pray that you enter not into temptation. It hurt us in the last garden. Don't let it destroy us in this garden. What he hears when he is on this battleground, he hears the voice of Satan saying, you shall not surely die. The same voice in the first garden is in his ear in the second garden. He's in agony as he listens to Satan. You shall not surely die. The agent of fear runs in to challenge him. You are afraid, Jesus. And in agony, he's sweating, and the sweat turns to blood. It has to. It has to. As soon as the first drop of blood hits the ground, in the stage to the right and the stands to the right, the angels start rejoicing <laughs> because they think now redemption has come. The earth begins to quake, but he had to go further. Can I tell you that before the first drop of blood dropped off that cross, when the first drop of blood fell from the pore of his forehead and hit the ground that man was formed from, Jesus won the battle and the fight was over. But he could not finish without fulfilling the script because Isaiah said, you got to go further, Jesus. Because you must be despised and rejected of men. A man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Men are going to hide their faces from you. You're going to be despised. Men are not going to esteem you. You will bore our griefs and you will carry our sorrows. And Jesus hears Isaiah singing that scripture in his ear. And then something prophetic hits him. Here's a voice, not from the side, not from behind, not from Genesis, not from the first garden, not from the Bereshith, but from the future. Revelation 12, 11. And they overcame him by the blood 
of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. I came by to tell you tonight, we used to sing it all the time, the blood that Jesus shed for me way back on Calvary. Talk back to me. It flows to the highest mountain. It reaches to the lowest. Talk back to me. All oh, the blood that Jesus shed for me, it shall never, never lose its power. When that blood hit the ground in that garden, Satan shook. Demons turned back. Darkness covered the earth. Why? Because the enemy knew my day is over and the Savior has won. And the prophecy of Genesis 3.15 becomes the revelation of chapter 22. I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between your seed and her seed. You are going to bruise him but he is going to crush your head. And I came by to tell you tonight, the moment that soldier broke the legs of the first thief, he walked by the center cross for some odd reason, and he broke the legs of the other thief. He should have come back and broke the legs of Jesus, but he couldn't do it because scripture wouldn't allow him to do it. Because the Bible says his bones shall not be broken so the soldier could do what only he could do and he took the spear and when he did what he did he pierced his heart and the bible doesn't say out came water and blood because sanctification cannot come before justification blood had to run past water and blood came out first and that's the way John saw it blood and water because justification must precede sanctification and I came by to tell you that it's time for you to get the blood back active in your life talk about the blood bleed the blood call on the blood talk to to the blood listen to the blood look for the blood the blood of Jesus is the most powerful agent that has ever been sent to this earth somebody ought to throw their head back get on your feet open your mouth and say thank you Jesus for your blood the blood that Jesus shed for me Somebody ought to jump underneath the fountain of that blood. Somebody ought to dive in the flow of that blood. Somebody ought to lift your hands and receive the blood. Somebody walk in here with stuff in your life you need off of you. And I came by to tell you, preaching can't do it. The crown of thorns can't do it. The dirt can't do it. The cross can preach, but it can't cleanse. Only the blood can cleanse you. We preach the cross. We plead the blood. We preach the cross, but we plead the blood. Tonight I've come to preach the cross of Jesus Christ to you. The sacrifice of a Savior. But I came to tell you, the cross is only as powerful as the blood that ran down it. I wish I had about 30 people that would throw your hands up and shout, I plead the blood. I plead the blood over my children. I plead the blood over my wife. I plead the blood over my grandbabies. I plead the blood over my church. I plead the blood over my job. I plead the blood over my car. I plead the blood over my past. I plead the blood over my future. I plead the blood. I dare you to shout it four times. I plead the blood. I plead the blood. I plead the blood. Lord, let your blood start flowing from this side to this side. Start cleansing. Start cleaning this up. Do what only your blood can do. Hallelujah. 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 I'm not done yet. The blood is called the overcoming blood Woo. because there is nothing polluted.
rooted in the blood of Jesus. Some of you need a blood transfusion tonight. And there's one that is about to happen because all the impurities that are in you are about to be washed out of you by the pure blood of Jesus Christ. Every unclean thing is about to be cleaned up by the blood of Jesus. Lord, let your blood run through this house. In the name of Jesus, I want you to take 15 seconds and give him praise for his blood. I can see a stream of his blood, but I want a flow of his blood and a fountain of his blood. Thank you, Jesus. Bless your name. Shani ikotola ha, oravavavava kusuria na, asara na na kaisha. I did it for you. I did it for you. I did it for you. Now that's a 96-year-old saint of God, 96 years old, telling you that the Holy Ghost said. Jesus shed his blood. Come on, put your hand right here and say, the blood is for me. 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 Bless your name, Jesus. Would you just be so kind as to lift your hands toward heaven? Make a, just make a funnel right there. Would you be that kind as to just lift your hand? Make a big funnel, come on. I remember studying today for the blood. I got in the shower before I came over here and I was taking a shower. My eyes were closed and I was just praying. And I said, Lord, thank you for your blood. And I closed my eyes and I just imagined that shower was not pumping out water. But that shower was pumping out the cleansing blood of Jesus. Whew. When I got out of that shower, I felt so clean. Do you remember when you first got saved? How clean you felt? That's because the blood got a hold of you. Would you lift your hands now, Father? Let the blood flow. Let your blood flow today, in this place. Today, it will never lose its power. That's it, Tony. Come on, lift those hands. Y'all know that's it. Mm, come on. The blood that Jesus shed Sing it, church. for me. Way back. Huh. Way back on Calvary. The blood that gives me strength from yeah. day to day from day to day it will never lose its power my dad had his first heart attack when he was 42 years old triple bypass surgery Back in that day, they had to take the heart out and put it on a table. Ah. He didn't know Jesus. But my older sister did. Come on, Bishop. Come on, Bishop. And she walked in there. Daddy, they put his heart back in and run plastic all the way down to the middle of his legs. Full of plastic, closed him up. 
And he opened his eyes, and my mom and myself and my sister were in there. My sister looked down at my dad and said, Dad, you have to give your heart to Jesus. And he said, I will, I will. She led him in the sinner's prayer. And as soon as she did, she could sing like an angel. She's going on to be with my dad in heaven now. But as soon as they prayed that prayer, she started singing this song. And I could feel the power of God invade that whole hospital room. And I feel it in here tonight. Can you sing it one more time, Tommy? Come on, lift those hands. The blood that Jesus, that Jesus, that's how she's singing. Jesus shed Come on, for me. For me. That's how she's singing, just like that. <laughs> Way back. Way back on Calvary, the blood that gives me strength. Boy, my daddy started crying. From there, those tears were coming out his face. Come on now, praise him. Worthy is the Lamb. His power. Worthy is the Lamb. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you for the blood. Thank you for the blood. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for the fountain field. Come on, let's stay in it for about two minutes here. Something's happening in the building right now. God is turning stuff around. The blood is intimidating Satan right out of your life. It reaches. The blood, the blood is intimidating every problem to back up out your life. The blood is reversing the curse right now. The blood is healing sickness right now. Bless your name, Jesus. Glory to God. God is good. High five three people and tell them thank God for the blood tonight. And then you may be seated.